Gayatri is a second year master's student here at McMaster in the Faculty of Health Sciences. She is in the medical science program in the area of infection and immunology, working in the lab of Dr. Soret. Gayatri completed her undergraduate degree at McMaster as well in honors life sciences. So, hi guys, my name is Gayatri, and I'm going to be showing you a brief um, talk on what my research is about. Um, so I'm going to be concentrating on the exacerbations associated with um, chronic airway infections, specifically cystic fibrosis, and I'm going to be introducing it to you as a polymicrobial disease. So, oh, okay. Just a sec, it's not showing up here. Mm. Okay. Okay, so a little bit um, about me. Uh, I'm a second year master's student here in the medical sciences um, program, and it's a thesis-based master's, so it's roughly two years. So if everything goes well, I'll be graduating at the end of August. Um, so there's five different sub-departments within my program, and I'm in the infection and immunity program. Um, I didn't really highlight the details on requirements to get into the program or things like that, because there's a pretty decently comprehensive, um, detailed website that you can look up. And there's also, um, they also have an office on fourth floor health sciences building. So from a very broad perspective, my project concerns profiling the lung microbiome. And this is just um, within the lungs, um, a complex community of um, different microbes. So this could be bacteria, fungi, um, viruses, and I'm looking at it in the perspective of individuals with cystic fibrosis and really looking at um, exploring bacteri bacterial drivers that cause an exacerbation, which I'll define um, later on. So starting off pretty broad, where I'm sure you guys have been introduced to a few different chronic airway infections like asthma or COPD. So they're just recurrent infections that could either result from the lower respiratory tract, so this is your trachea, your primary bronchi, your lungs, or from your upper respiratory tract, which is your nasal cavity, um, your larynx, your pharynx, or it could be a combination of both. So things that you inspire from your environment can enter through your nose, they can make it way down to the lower respiratory tract, and you could colonize and cause an infection. So these are just common areas where an infection could occur. So you have your lungs, your sinus, your nose, your throat, and these are just common um, infections which you guys may have been familiar with or even have experienced. So like common cold, pneumonia, sinusitis, bronchitis. And these infections are typically caused by a bacteria or a virus. And I concentrate, well, uh, my research looks at um, bacterial infections, um, which cause severe um, worsening of symptoms within cystic fibrosis individuals. So when someone has an infection, um, so especially when it's a lung infection, the sample that um, a clinic will take is a sputum sample. So that's something, that's your spit. And it could either be expectorated spontaneously, so you just cough it up, or induced. Um, so you like breathe in some sort of like saline or concentrated salt water. And so you send that off to the clinical microbiology lab. And what they do is they do routine culturing um, and they screen for certain pathogens that have been shown to cause an infection. And so there's a different select media type. So these are just synthetically created environments that are made with different supplements and nutrients in order to facilitate for the growth and isolation of certain um, pathogens which have been shown to create infections. And some of these things are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus, which have been um, common um, pathogens causing respiratory infections. So once they isolate a pathogen, there's subsequent treatment depending on what they find, and it's usually a general course of antibiotics for a bacterial infection. Now the major limitation with clinical microbiology is that you're looking for a defined set of pathogens. So you're looking for things that you already expect to find. So I look at um, airway um, infection and the concept of cystic fibrosis. So before I go into CF, I just want to know what you guys know about CF. So the first one is 60 to 40 in terms of prevalence rate. So adult, children to adults. So does anybody want to choose what they think is right? <laughs> yeah. So um, F508 Delta is the most common CFTR mutation. There's five different classes of mutations. This one's a processing mutation. So um, the protein is made, but it's not properly folded. So there is, due to this mutation, there's a chloride imbalance, which causes a lot of the subsequent symptoms that a CF individual um, is infected by. So CF, um, as many of you may or not have been introduced to, is an autosomal receptive pattern of inheritance. It is due to a mutation of the CFTR gene. 
and about 4,200 Canadians are affected annually. And if we were to look at a demographic spread um, within Canada, in Ontario, that's about 1,473 individuals. And of these individuals, about 885 adults are affected. So my research um, concentrates on the adult CF clinic, and we actually have one here at McMaster um, on the fourth floor. So it is a multi-systemic disease, so there's multiple different organs within the body which can contribute to this disease. Um, so what do you guys think is the, accounts for the majority of the mortality in CF? Anyone? Yeah, it's B. <laughs> so it accounts for 90% of the mortality in individuals, which is a large amount um, uh, accounting due to respiratory failure. So if you were to look at the airway of a healthy individual, you would see that there's a um, very clear airway with very thin lumen, not much of a mucosal layer, the smooth muscle and trachea muscle work properly. And if we were to look at an individual with cystic fibrosis, you have an obstructed airway. So um, due to that CFTR mutation, there's an increased um, amount of mucosal uh, mucus being accumulated within your um, airway, and so this results in increased inflammation and subsequent infection. And due to this um, accumulation of mucus, things that you inspire from the environment get lodged within the mucus, and this promotes infection. So as I alluded to earlier, an exacerbation um, is a worsening of symptoms when an throughout the individual's um, disease progression. So here on the y-axis, you have time and years, so as an individual progresses through a disease. And then your y-axis, you have your lung function, and it's measured in your FEV1, which is your forced expiratory volume. So an individual with CF has, um, in a simple point of view, has two different states of disease. So you're at a stable point when they're not experiencing an infection or not undergoing an exacerbation. And there's a point during when they have an exacerbation. And these exacerbations are commonly due to an immune response that are response to an infection. Um, so once you have an exacerbation, these exacerbations are resolved through some sort of treatment, so typically some sort of antibiotic treatment. But um, once the individual has resolved, they never go back to their baseline FEV1. So there is some sort of permanently irreversible loss of lung function. And as you progress through disease, your frequency of exacerbation increases, and this causes an accumulation of a loss in lung function, which then causes mortality in these individuals. And there's no clinical or microbiological predictors of what could cause an exacerbation. So there's been a multitude of research that's been done in cystic fibrosis. Um, fun fact, the CFTR gene was sequenced in Canada, um, in Toronto, at SickKids, which is pretty cool. Um, and from there, we've done, uh, looked at a lot of different areas. It's a very multidisciplinary approach when it comes to treating cystic fibrosis. So things with gene therapy, things looking at the CFTR protein, so really looking at the source um, in order to like, fix that protein, in order to create, secrete more protein, secrete more chloride. But what I really want to focus on is personalized medicine. So the CF um, population is extremely heterogeneous. So treatment can't be standardized because the cause of exacerbation isn't going to be um, the same from one person to the next. So research has come um, a long way since where it started. So does anybody want to gander a guess what the median age of individuals with CF is? So this is now like the median age of what we could die or um, the population which we could diagnose them at. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 23. Um, so that just means that individuals are able to live longer in order for us to diagnose them at a later stage. Also, CF patient survival over the decades has immensely increased. Um, in 1930, the infants wouldn't be able to live past the age of one or two, but now it's about 52.3 years, which is remarkable. So back to that um, clinical microbiology that I mentioned, there's in cystic fibrosis, there's also conventional pathogens, which are highly recognized by clinicians, and what clinics look for in when an individual undergoes an exacerbation. 
So here, um, these are just different pathogens that are recognized in different individuals at a high abundance, so highly present. And I just want to highlight two. These are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus because these are commonly recognized in the literature to be causing an exacerbation in a large um, population of CF individuals. However, it's not just about these two pathogens. So there's been a um, lot of recent studies looking at um, more lowly abundant pathogens that could perhaps be more active and causing an exacerbation. So this first study looked at um, the bacterial load. So how we measure bacterial load in um, the lab is looking at the CFU per mil. So that's what you have on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have days prior to a cystic fibrosis pulmonary exacerbation. So you would expect if this is to be the pathogen that's causing an exacerbation and driving a um, disease progression, you expect um, the bacterial load to increase when you're getting closer to an exacerbation or even at least on the day of the exacerbation. But as you can see, the bacterial load doesn't increase. And if you were to look at the total bacterial load, which is on that white line, I'm sorry, that black line, um, this is um, a representation of all the different bacterial population that you have residing in the lungs. You can see that doesn't really change much either. So this could either allude to the fact that there's other bacterial populations there that are low, more lowly abundant that could be fluctuating, causing exacerbation, or maybe it's not even a dependent on bacterial load at all. This um, is a longitudinal study that was done with one individual. And on the top, those numbers correspond to the individual's age. And these bars um, are each sampling method in which a sputum sample was taken. So the patient spit and it was sent for sequencing. And the colors correspond to different bacteria, which you could see at the bottom. And the more you see of that color, the more it was present in that sample. So um, I just want to highlight the ones with the E underneath, and that stands for an exacerbation. So when these samples were taken, the individual was undergoing a respiratory infection. And so as you could see, there's a large diversity of bacteria there. So it may not be just one pathogen that's causing this exacerbation. It could be synergistic effects of different, different bacterial population or things that, are just, that haven't been studied as much. So here, green and yellow are the Staph aureus and Pseudomonas that I mentioned earlier that are very clinically recognized. But as you can see, they're not always the ones that are most abundant. So in our lab, the Surat lab, we employ a technique called culture-enriched methodologies. And this is in order to survey not things that we expect to find there, but in order to really re recapitulate a more um, holistic uh, microbiome. And so these are examples of samples that I would get from individuals with cystic fibrosis. And it, they're very heterogeneous. So there's a lot of things going there. There's a lot of saliva. There's a lot of mucus. So first thing we do is we homogenize it so that it all looks the same. And so you could either do this through physical homogenization, so that's with a syringe, or you use a mucolytic in order to really break apart those disulfide bonds within the mucus. And DTT is just a mucolytic to sort of homogenize it. Then you, instead of using select um, environments or select media types in order to culture for or uh, isolate different organisms, we use um, a vast majority of culture plates in order to really look for everything that's there. We also do a DNA and RNA extraction. So that DNA profile is showing you all the different bacteria that reside dead and alive. And that RNA profile should be only showing you things that are, are active. We then um, send that off for sequencing in order to identify what sort of um, pathogen we're looking at or what sort of bacterial species. So if you were to compare this technique to the routine um, clinical culturing, you could see that the diversity of the bacteria population immensely increases. So on the left-hand side, this is what your biology or your tree would look like if you were just looking at routine clinical culturing. And your right-hand side is your culture-enriched methodologies. So um, this is just to show you um, a method that was employed using DNA and RNA-based molecular profiling. It, this method is called TRFLP and RT-TRFLP. They're just profiles looking at the DNA and RNA profile. PCR method, it's an old technique now. But it's the first and so far only paper that shows you that there you could actually look at, distinguish within the sample, that you could distinguish between active populations. So there's um, a highly uh, high proportion of the sample is active, whereas it's um, comparing it to the dead population that's there. So in my project, um, usually in a thesis-based project, you typically have three different objectives. 
Um, so my first one is to look at this comparative methodology, um, culture enriched and DNA RNA profiling, in order to see what sort of drives an exacerbation. Um, and my next two um, objectives look at a specific um, factory group, and it's a Streptococcus milleri group, um, in order to see if this one is highly prevalent in our population because it has been isolated in other geographical areas like Calgary and has been shown to be extremely prevalent and virulent, um, but it hasn't been isolated anywhere else. So my other two objectives are concerned with that, but I'm just going to show you a little glimpse of what um, my results will look like with the first aim. So um, using the two comparative methods that I showed you, so that's extensive culturing with the different media types in order to grow a lot of different bacteria, and then you have your DNA and RNA extraction showing you both the dead bacteria population and also the active bacteria population. And so this is just an example of what culturing plates will look like. So once I get a sample and I plate it on different types of plates, I'll pick different colonies and also count the number of colonies that I've picked in order to get a sense of how much of each morphological colony type there is. And I'll send it for sequencing. And then once I get that back, I could correlate that to how many of those colonies that I counted. So that will get me my CFU per mil, which is a metric in order to measure your bacterial load. So the ones in the red highlight um, the clinically like, recognized pathogens. So you have your Staph aureus and your Pseudomonas. But also the one in the green is the one that is my primary bacterial population I'm looking at for the next two. Um, objectives, which just goes to show you that there's a, a variety of bacterial populations within the sample, and any number of them could be causing an exacerbation. The DNA and RNA extraction um, is similar to that taxonomic plot I showed earlier. So um, the more of one color is representative, more of that bacteria being there. So the D stands for the DNA and the R for the RNA. And the numbers that you see beside it is me teasing apart this feed and sample because I wanted to see if different areas of that feed and sample had higher active bacterial populations. So if I could really distinguish the heterogeneity of a sample, that could perhaps help in um, standardizing speed and processing protocol. So here you could see um, there seems to be variation activity across the sputum sample. Um, where in condition one, there seems to be um, higher haemophilus, or as haemophilus and pseudomonas increase as we like, go through the conditions. So the purpose of my research is to identify active bacteria that cause um, exacerbations, so really be able to distinguish dead versus active, and also to see if there's variation in bacterial activity within a sample, which could help in standardizing speed and processing, which could be saving a lot of time and money. Um, my next two aims, which I didn't really talk about here, is um, looking at the role of a uh, bacterial population called SMG, which is not as uh, studied, but has been shown to be highly virulent in certain populations and has been shown to cause um, disease progression. Um, so the overarching purpose of my research is to improve management and the frequency of those exacerbations. So as you saw in that um, depiction of an exacerbation, they, frequent, they increase drastically through the progression of disease. So minimizing that would be an immense improvement, but also to emphasize the need for individualized and targeted treatments. So um, what to do with a master's? Like, why am I doing one? Um, you could transfer to a PhD. And I, for a thesis-based master's, uh, I think you have to do it within your second year. So it's between eight months and 20. 22 months? Between eight months and 22 months of you starting your master's, you have, um, that's your window of opportunity to transfer to a PhD. Um, or you could do a PhD after you complete a master's if you want to pursue academia. Um, so you could do PhD, postdoc, and then perhaps maybe get faculty. Um, you could do medical school. Um, yeah. Are you going to a pharmaceutical company? It's a very cushy job. Um, you could be a lab tech. Uh, you could, if you don't like a master's, it's not end-all, be-all. You could pursue other disciplines. You could go into business. Um, but like a master's in a, isn't a hindrance on your future. If anything, you'll learn what you don't like. So um, that's all.